What's your greatest fear? You've probably been asked that before. It's like one of those icebreaker questions that they ask you at your freshman orientation your first day of college. As cliche as it might be, I think it's fascinating. You can learn so much about someone from just that one question. How they view the world, how they move through life, what motivates them. So, what's my greatest fear? Well, I've got a few actually. Curious? Here, let me show you. Welcome to Stone Cold Moderation, a thinking man's journey toward a healthier relationship with alcohol. I'm your host, Chase Lee. Let's continue with our discussion. When I say, I want you to pause this podcast, I want you to go into an empty room and be alone for a moment. And I want you to sit in silence for a minute or so. No music, no phone, don't do anything. Don't even meditate. Just sit there and be. Stare at the wall for one minute. If you can't do this right now for whatever reason, try it when you get home later. But if you're listening to this and you're in quarantine right now like I am, you should be able to pull this off. Okay, ready? I'll see you in a minute. Three, two, one, begin. The silence is deafening, isn't it? That's my greatest fear. That brief sting of loneliness, the dull ache of emptiness. Maybe it's just me and that's fine, but I know that I can't be in my room and not put on music or check my phone or turn on the TV just to provide some white noise. I just can't. The silence is too intense. And strangely enough, I'm an introvert. I'm a pretty solitary person. I require time to myself to recharge my batteries. Constant social interaction exhausts me, so I like to spend one or two days a week by myself to do my own thing and regenerate. But that silence, it's too much. This loneliness thing, it's a mystery. In the art of happiness, A Chronicle of Interviews with the Dalai Lama by American psychologist Howard Cutler. Cutler asked the Dalai Lama if he ever feels lonely, to which he bluntly replies, no. He goes on to explain that his feeling of connection with the rest of the world, his ability to emphasize and relate to anyone and everyone, frees him from loneliness. Incredible, right? After all, This is a man that has taken a vow of celibacy and will never engage in a romantic relationship. Yet, he lives perfectly content. Such elegance and the ability to just connect to everyone and everything he lays his eyes on. And the simplicity of it. Astonishing, really. But is that feasible for the rest of us? For normal people? I have been single for six years now, and I don't want to be single forever. The idea of being 50, 40, 50, 60, and single and living alone, that scares me. I'm like most people. I want to be loved, and I'd like to find someone to share life with. I hope it will happen for me at some point. But even though the solitude has been rough at times over the last six years, I distinctly remember feeling extremely lonesome even during my last relationship with someone who was really fantastic. It didn't add up. I shouldn't have felt that way. And that's when my drinking was at its peak. It's clear to me now that loneliness is in the eye of the beholder. Like any other emotion we experience, it's purely cerebral. That statement might seem self-evident at first glance, But most people attribute lonesomeness to actually being solitary or single or without many friends. 
But I know a lot of lonely people who have friends who are in relationships. And I know that the loneliness that I felt in my life has had less to do with my external circumstances and more to do with what is taking place between my ears. And I know how much those feelings have contributed, contributed to my drinking. How a little bit of alcohol can suddenly curb those emotions. How it can numb the sting a little bit, if only momentarily. How it can make us feel connected to something before we must return to the humdrum of our sober brains. In these times of social media, of information overload and stimulation overload, it's easy for one to feel small and lonely and to reach for a bottle. And now, to make things even worse, we're stuck in fucking quarantine. So what can we do? All right, so full disclosure, um, this is an episode that I was dreading doing and had like planned out to do way in the future. Um, but well, because I was dreading it and because I just didn't seem uh, appropriate to do it so fast. But since now we are in quarantine, it seems perfectly appropriate to do. And that's why we're, that's why I'm doing it. Um, yeah. Loneliness. It's uncomfortable because I don't think, I think there's such a, a stigma to it. There's such like weakness and vulnerability and in, in saying like just the words, I am lonely. I feel lonely. And I don't think I've ever had an actual conversation with another person, another human being about this and said those words. And now I'm doing a podcast and potentially sharing this with a lot of people. So go, go me. Um, but yeah, it's, I don't know. It's, it seems very, very personal and it's, it's hard to talk about. It's yeah, it's weird. It's a little uncomfortable, but here we are. So we're going to do it <laughs> because I know that a lot of people are probably feeling it hard right now being in quarantine and I'm as well. So here we go. Um, I think it's something that is rampant in our society, especially being an American. Um, let's talk about that. I read an article a while back and I think it was sent to me. I think it was probably sent to me by a family member on like Facebook or something. It's written in the walrus, which I guess is a, an online magazine of some sort and written by a woman named Re Rachel Geese, I guess. I'll leave information on that in the show notes, of course. Um, it's called The Epidemic of Isolation Among Young Men. And I read this article and basically kind of goes through the studies of talking about how um, young men are more susceptible to losing their connections with their, especially with their, their male friends during the course of their lifetime um, due to causes of, you know, like social conditioning, fears of perceived homosexuality, like all these things. Right. Um, and I thought it was really interesting because I had never, I had never considered that. And I, I, you know, men do men certainly do not talk about this stuff. <laughs> like I have ne like, again, I've never had a conversation about this with one of my guy friends or anybody else. Um, but apparently it's, it's, it's serious. And now that I'm kind of aware of it, I have seen it a lot more. I've seen it. I've observed it a lot more in not only like people who are close to me and in my life, but also, you know, kind of just observing other people that I meet. Right. I think a lot of it comes from, I think a lot of it, um, I mean, I'm sure this affects people all over the world, men all over the world, but I think being an American also and the way our kind of life structure um, is kind of organized, I think it affects us even more, right? Because we, you know, we finish school and we go. A lot of us leave, go to another state, another city um, to study in university, to study in college. And we say bye to our high school friends, our childhood friends, right? Make a lot of new friends in college. After four years, say bye to those friends as well. Some, I know we all 
disperse, right? Like all of my closest guy friends are dispersed throughout not only um, the United States, but like the world, right? Um, and it's really hard to keep up with people. And this article also talks about how it's more difficult for young men to um, build and sustain connections because we're not as willing for some reason to um, try to make new friends and to try to invest a lot of um, time and energy into those new friends. Okay. And I have totally noticed that in my, in my life. Like I still, I still <laughs> consider my best friends in the world to be like my college buddies and a couple people from high school. But I've definitely noticed that in my travels and, and living in different cities, it, it gets harder. It gets, it gets, you know, more difficult and more difficult to kind of work up the, I guess like the, the, the energy, the social energy to, to, to invest in new people. Um, yeah. And I've noticed that in a lot of people who are close to me, but certainly loneliness is not just an infliction that can be found in young American men. It's everywhere, right? Rampant in our society, which for me kind of begs the question, how can a person who has an active social life, who f on paper has a good life, also be lonely. I know you're wondering, so I'm going to tell you what the Dalai Lama thinks about this. <laughs> um, yeah, big fan of the Dalai Lama. And I'm talking about the, 14, the current Dalai Lama, who is the 14th Dalai Lama. Can't pronounce his name, but amazing man. Read about him a little bit. What he says is that Westerners are so hyper-focused on achievement and uh, career, um, achieving our goals, that we forget about being and we search for happiness externally rather than focusing on cultivating our inner being and cultivating happiness within ourselves. So it's kind of this idea that you can be extremely successful and extremely rich, and at the same time, you can be extremely miserable. And I think this to be true, and I've seen, I've observed a lot of people like this, and I've heard about a lot of people like this. Um, kind of the idea that we always regress to our mean level of happiness, right? So whether really, really good things happen to us in our lives or really, really bad things happen to us, we kind of always regress to the mean. So you can be somebody who has this amazing life on paper, but if your inner world is unhappiness, you're going to always kind of be unhappy. So this is something that the Dalai Lama uh, talks about a lot, especially when he meets up with Americans and Westerners. And another observation, very astute observation that he makes about Westerners are how dependent we are on our romantic relationships for our well-being. Right, He has spoken about how people invest everything, all of their happiness or their prospects for happiness into their partner, and it ends up backfiring because then people end up in very codependent relationships, very toxic relationships, blaming all of their problems onto their partner, putting everything, all their shit onto their partner, and eventually saying to that person, you're the, pro you're the reason I'm unhappy, so I'm getting rid of you. And then they break up. And maybe that's why the divorce rate is so high in the United States. I don't know. Just a theory. But I can certainly attest to those things because when I have been in relationships, I have still felt extreme levels of anxiety, depression, and loneliness. Which, again, doesn't add up when you're, if you're with somebody. And I've had pretty good luck in relationships. Amazing luck in the relationships, actually. Totally out of my league, right? Um, still felt really lonely for some reason. And the longer I lasted in those relationships, the more I drank. And the crazier I got. Um, so I can certainly... Yeah, I'm a, I, have some, I have some experience there, so to speak. So I'm a bit conflicted. Do feeling, the question that comes up for me is do feelings of loneliness have to do more with the people or the lack of people that we have in our lives, 
at a given moment, or does it have to do more with what is going on mentally with us? Or, and are these feelings of loneliness kind of just like a mask for our general discontent of our lives and our lack of happiness in our inner worlds? That's a question that I would like to have answered. And I would like to get some listener response on that. So please hit me up to answer, help me answer that question. Um, email chase at stonecoldmoderation.com. Hit me up on social media, any social media, Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, whatever you got. Um, and check out my website, um, www.stonecoldmoderation.com for more ways to get in touch with me. I would really love to hear back from some of you guys. So one thing I definitely think is going on right now is that the quarantine is amplifying a lot of these negative thoughts. Okay. I, for me personally, I'm having anxiety being in, in four walls all day. Um, raise your hand if you're questioning like all of your life decisions right now, right? Like I'm, uh, yeah, having all these thoughts, like what am I doing with my life? Uh, where am, where am I going to be in five years, 10 years? I wasn't having these, these negative thoughts like two months ago, two months ago, I was like in Paris enjoying my life. Right. And now it's tough. Um, and I know a lot of people out there are feeling similarly. And I know that a lot of people are having mad cravings to drink, right? Um, people are bored, right? There's a lot of time to sit and think, and it's really easy to grab a bottle when you're when you're when you're feeling down. For a lot of people, I'm looking at a lot of like on Twitter, um, people that I'm following on Twitter, a lot of like Facebook groups, and people are really complaining about stuff like this. So it's real, um, and I get it. I think. One thing that's happening, being in quarantine is completely cutting off all of our connections, right? It's cutting off um, a lot of personal connections. We can't see friends. We can't see family. Um, doing Zoom chats is just not the same, right? Um, it's cutting off our connection to nature, to the outside world. All these things that we are very important in our lives. We're not able to have physical contact. Um, and it's, it's, it's brutal and it's, it's painful actually. And connection, um, I believe can be a major defense and ally against the desire to drink and the need to drink amazing Ted talk. I'm going to leave the, again, leave the link in the descriptions of this episode, amazing Ted talk by a writer and journalist named Johan Hari, I believe is his name. And he talks about um, the misconceptions of addiction and how they relate to connection, right? So he talks about this, he talks about a study done by, in the, the 1970s, done by a Canadian psychologist named Bruce K. Alexander right? Um, Bruce K. Alexander before had seen um, many studies done with rats, right? So th there had been a lot of studies done with rats. Basically, you have a rat in a cage and you put in the cage with the rat normal water and then another bottle of water laced with heroin or cocaine. And in all of these examples, the rats would always go for the bottle with the drug, right? And they would almost always OD and kill themselves, essentially, right? So Dr. Alexander, okay, seeing these experiments said, oh, I think there's, there's, there's something wrong here, something wrong with this, right? Maybe I, may I, maybe I can do a little bit better. And he um, set up an experiment in which... He basically created a rat park and he put all of the rats into these like these parks, uh, many, many rats and gave them, you know, cool like play toys and stuff, gave them a bunch of food 
and you know they could run around all day and and mate blah 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 and he said this experiment will tell the truth because in the previous experiments the rats were alone there are rats in the cage alone and in those cases that's why the rats were preferring the the drugs taking the drug laced water he found that in his experiment in this rat park where all the rats were socialized right rat heaven basically that they didn't have the need for the drug laced water that they would go for just the normal water okay so his conclusion was that things that we know about exper- about addiction are incorrect um that perhaps it's not about the the brain or the mind of of the individual but it's about the it's about the cage right it's about the connections or the lack of connections that we have in our lives okay and right a main criticism of that experiment would be well it's rats rats are different than human beings but now many successful rehabilitation drug rehabilitation programs are kind of based off of this principle so anyways um this yeah this ted talk yo by this guy named johan hari i highly recommend you checking it out it was really really interesting for me again i'll leave a link to that in um the note the show notes um what was i talking about totally lost myself ah yes okay so right now in quarantine we are kind of like these rats stuck in cages okay we don't have we're not able to enjoy the connections that we were able to enjoy a month and a half ago and two months ago so it's really easy for people to simply reach for a bottle and i get it i'm having the same cravings um just last week i ended up drinking a little bit of wine and i kind of went overboard and i've i've didn't i hadn't felt this in a long time but i kind of felt and i felt the desire to continue to drink and drink and get drunk and i ended up stopping myself but i was afterwards the next day not happy with myself um because i overpassed I like, I broke my rule a little bit. I went above that. Um, and I didn't feel good about it. Felt, felt guilty and a, a little bit, a little bit of the, the old shame coming back and I was not happy. Um, so I get it. Um, the cravings are real. The need to drink, the desire to drink, um, is strong right now because it's a natural being in this quarantine. We're not supposed to live like this. At the end of the day, we are social animals. Okay. And so it's tough and alcohol can always temporarily be there to fill that void, that void of connection. You have one or two drinks, you start to feel good. You start to feel warm and calm and you start to feel somehow connected and you don't know exactly what that is. It's like kind of abstract, but you feel connected to something. But you know, if you keep drinking, you know what the consequences are going to be. So for me, I am very determined to get through this quarantine and not to submit to the, the isolation and the lack of connection and get drunk. I'm committed to that. So what can we do? Okay. This is a tough one because these are unexpected, unprecedented circumstances. I think that this could be a really good opportunity for some people to try a 30 day alcohol free period. If you ever submit to one of these online, like alcohol sobriety courses, there's a million on the internet. I get them all the time on my Facebook feed. Um, or if you read like, um, like a sobriety book or something, a lot of these programs, they recommend for you to start out a 30 day alcohol free, like trial. So you go 30 days, no alcohol, boom. And that might sound pretty, pretty drastic, but I think drastic times call for drastic measures. Right. And I think this is definitely a drastic time. I think it could be really impactful for people. Um, if you do this 30 days, if you can get through it, um, mental health is going to be better. 
um, physical health is going to be better. You're going to be more well rested. All the benefits of not drinking, right? And it you could build something for the future. So aside from all the other crap that you don't want me to, that you don't need to hear from me, right? In terms of, oh, you know, occupy your mind with hobbies and, you know, knit um, and uh, learn how to juggle or something to occupy your time. Because you don't need to hear that stuff from me, right? I think that this could be a really, provide a really interesting opportunity for some people out there who are struggling, who are drinking too much, who, who don't feel good. Maybe if you're listening to this podcast, it's because you have, um, because you have a longstanding problem with alcohol that I think this could be a fantastic opportunity to make a dress except for it, go 30 days without alcohol. Just a suggestion, just something to think about. The other thing, okay, I am gonna, I am gonna bother some people and give, and give one, one, another suggestion that I think is super, super crucial. And I swear by this, and I kid you not, meditation has like completely changed my life, and it is the best thing ever. Five minutes a day, ten minutes a day, what, whatever you can do. Um, meditation has completely changed my thought patterns. It's made me such a more positive person. Um, it's lowered my anxiety. This is a topic that I actually want to devote like an entire episode to because it's been so like impactful on me, but man, it's, it's super, super powerful. I'll leave a couple of resources on the the show notes, but that's the other thing I, I, I got, I just got to say it, right? I'm sorry, but meditation, you probably heard this before and you're probably like, oh, shut, shut up. I don't want to hear this from me, but man, meditation is super, super powerful, super amazing. It's getting me through the quarantine. It's getting me through every day. Try it. Okay. Wrapping things up here. Um, final thoughts. I'm, I know I've gone off on some tangents, I hope I've made some sense in this episode. Bringing it back to loneliness, for me, very mysterious, whether or not it's what we have in our cages, so to speak, our social connections or lack of social connections, or if it is more of, if loneliness is more of a reflection of our general mental state or our general discontent with our own lives not really sure about that um what i am sure about is that it's being amplified right now in quarantine and that it can be an absolutely massive motivation for people to reach for a bottle and drink and i know people out there are struggling with this and i'm struggling with it too so I'm glad that I did this episode. I'm proud of myself for doing it. It's It's been difficult <laughs> to find the thoughts and to kind of make these reflections. Um, but I hope that people, I hope that people out there are doing good. And if you're somebody who knows me personally and you need to talk, um, yeah, hit me up. You know, you know where to, you know where to reach me. And if you're somebody out there who's listening to this and doesn't know me, hit me up. <laughs> I have I've, I've got plenty of time um okay so last thing challenge for for this episode I'm gonna challenge people to meditate to try this if you've never tried it before just hear me out okay um I'm gonna say usually when I do meditations there's some like visualiz- visualizations that I do obviously don't have time to explain that now but if you check out the resources that I'll leave on the show notes if you invest the time to like read those those books, um, if you have the time, you do. It's quarantine. Um, you'll 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 see some other techniques, and there's a million things out there on the internet. But I, I digress. Um, challenge you to meditate, thirty deep breaths, right, very slow. Breathe in and out. Um, paying attention the entire time to your breath and that's why i think counting to 30 right very slowly it'll bring you into the room um 
you'll feel a lot more calm. And after the 30 seconds or the 30 breaths, you should feel a little different. So we're going to be in isolation. We're going to be alone. But my idea, right, for doing this little meditation is to be pro proactively alone instead of just alone. Alone by Edgar Allan Poe. From childhood's hour I have not been as others were. I have not seen as others saw. I could not bring my passions from a common spring, from the same source I have not taken. My sorrow I could not awaken my heart to joy at the same tone. And all I loved, I loved alone. Then, in my childhood, in the dawn, of a most stormy life was drawn. From every depth of good and ill, the mystery which binds me still. From the torrent or the fountain, from the red cliff of the mountain, from the sun that round me rolled, in its autumn tint of gold, from the lightning in the sky as it passed me flying by, from the thunder and the storm and the cloud that took the form when the rest of heaven was blue of a demon in my view. This has been the Stone Cold Moderation Podcast with Chase Lee. Thanks for listening. Make sure to check out the complete show notes of this episode on stonecoldmoderation.com where you can learn more about us. For access to more content, please subscribe to our YouTube channels, check us out on all other social media platforms, and make sure to tune in next time. We'll be talking about bros, brews, and male bonding.